Hey guys, this is Miss Bufford, and in this video, we're going to talk about Lewis dot structures for covalent compounds. So the goals for this video are to be able to draw Lewis dot structures to illustrate covalent compounds and be able to explain why molecules take the shape they do based on valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So we're going to talk about how to draw these Lewis dot structures first. And Lewis structures for covalent compounds are different from Lewis structures for ionic compounds because the structures for covalent compounds show how electrons are shared between atoms rather than being transferred. So here are some steps for drawing Lewis dot structures and then determining the molecular geometry. So first we need to determine what the central atom in the compound or the molecule is going to be. And we do this by looking at which atom is going to form the most bonds or which one has the most bonding electron orbitals. So what I've done, if you take a look at these atoms I've put up here, is I've drawn the Lewis dot structures for each of these atoms. And they're just representative of their chemical families. All right, so fluorine is just representative for all the halogens. Um, and the same is true for each of these elements up here. So... I've drawn their Lewis dot structures, and then I've drawn a little orbital showing where there are single electrons around these atoms. And those orbitals represent a place where a chemical bond or a covalent bond could occur. Okay, this is where an atom can um, pull in electrons or share electrons with other atoms. The non-bonding electron pairs are orbitals that are already full with their two electrons, and they can't have any more electrons. They're not going to share electrons through those orbitals. They're not going to give those away um, for these non-metal atoms. So we can, we can see that fluorine and all of the halogens are capable of forming one bond. Oxygen and any of the non-metals in oxygen's family are capable of forming two covalent bonds. Nitrogen and any of the non-metals in nitrogen's family are capable of forming three covalent bonds. And then carbon and silicone in its family are capable of forming four covalent bonds. And boron is capable <clears throat> of forming three covalent bonds. Um, and it has no non-bonding electron pairs. And the same with carbon, there's no non-bonding electron pairs around that. And then hydrogen's over here with its one valence electron and it can form one, um, one covalent bond, okay? So when we're trying to determine the central atom, we have to take a look at the atoms that are involved. In this case, we're gonna be drawing the Lewis dot structure for water, which is H2O. And if we look at hydrogen, hydrogen's only capable of forming one bond, okay? Oxygen, on the other hand, is capable of forming two bonds. And so in this case, oxygen is going to be our central atom. And so, uh, oh, I already had the numbers up there. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the Lewis structure for water, or I'm sorry, for oxygen first. And then what I want to do is I want to take the Lewis dot structures for the remaining two hydrogen atoms, and I want to um, set them up so that their orbitals are going to line up with the, or the bonding orbitals for this oxygen atom. And let's see, atoms can make a single bond a double bond or a triple bond with another atom depending on the number of bonding electron orbitals available by each of the atoms that are involved in um, the chemical bond. All right, so hydrogen is only capable of forming one bond, so it's only ever going to make single bonds. And um, oxygen, on the other hand, has the ability to either form two single bonds or one double bond. Okay, and in this case, because there are two separate hydrogen atoms, it's going to be forming two single bonds. Right, so we can see that now these hydrogens are moving in so that they're sharing those electrons with oxygen. And so if you want to look and see how oxygen's filling its, um, its outer shell with the full octet, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons now in its outer shell. Even though it's sharing um, four of those electrons, it's, they're still considered to have a full outer shell now. All right, so each shared electron pair is shown using a straight line that connects the element symbols. So I'm showing you this, you know, how these elements are going to be sharing these electrons with these orbitals. But when we draw the Lewis dot structures, 
we show those shared electron pairs using this straight line right here. So this, a straight line in a Lewis dot structure represents a shared pair of electrons, all right? So what we wanna do, um, it's, it's different looking at these on a flat surface versus looking at a 3D structure of these because atoms are not flat on paper, they're 3D structures. Um, and so you want to look at this final shape on paper and then kind of think about what it's going to look like in 3D. And I'll have some models that I'm going to show you guys in class one day this week um, so that you can actually get a feel for what these are going to look like in person or, or in, in the 3D structure. Um, but the way that I showed you to draw the Lewis dot structures where you're putting one electron in each orbital at a time and working your way around the atoms is going to help you be able to determine the molecular geometry a little better. Um, but when you're trying to determine that, you want to take into consideration the bonding electron pairs and the non-bonding electron pairs around that central atom. And these two non-bonding electron pairs on this oxygen they're not going to have atoms attached to them, but they're still there. There's still two electrons that have just as much negative charge as the other two electrons that are forming these bonds right here. And so these bonds and these two orbitals up here that have electrons in them, they're all repelling each other because they're all made of these negatively charged shared particles. Well, some of them are shared. All right. And so you have to think about these electrons trying to be or these electron pairs trying to be equally distant from each other around this, you know, spherical atom, okay? And on flat paper, it looks like this, and we call this a bent shape. And um, I'll show you again what these look like um, in person. I actually have some little pictures in here that, are, that might be a little bit more um, telling on what these are going to look like. But this is how we do a Lewis dot structure for a covalent compound. So let's take a look at some more examples, and we'll talk more about valent shell um, electron pair repulsion theory on this slide. So I'm just going to call it Vesper theory for right now just to save my voice. Um, so Vesper theory is used to predict the shapes of molecules based on the repulsion of the bonding and non-bonding electrons in the molecule. All right. The shape is determined by the number of bonding and non-bonding electron pairs on the central atom, as well as the number of bonding electrons on the other atoms or the peripheral atoms. Um, so drawing Lewis dot structures for these atoms can help us determine what shape a molecule is going to have. And so what I would like to do now is just, I'm going to try to organize this information in a way that makes it kind of easy to understand. And so like I said before, these atoms and these Lewis dot structures that I have drawn up at the very top are just representative of each of their families. Remember that fluorine's family, they're all going to have, you know, the same uh, Lewis dot structures. Oxygen's family, all those nonmetals have the same Lewis dot structures. And the same for nitrogen's family, carbon's family, and then boron itself. Okay. So they're just representative of their families. And when these atoms are the central atom in the molecules that they're in, these are the shapes that are possible for that um, atom to produce, depending on what it's bonding with. And I'm going to give you examples of a compound for each one of these shapes here in just a minute. Okay, so um, boron, when it's bonding with other things, has the ability to form a linear compound or a trigonal planar compound. Um, carbon has the ability to form a linear molecule, a trigonal planar molecule. So this is where we've got the central atom and we've got three things sticking out of that central atom, but they're all in the same plane. So if I were to put this flat down on a desk, all of the atoms would touch the desk, even the central one. Okay. Then carbon has the ability to form a tetrahedral shape, depending on what it's bonding with. And so carbon, if it had four separate things, let's say these are all hydrogens that are attached to the central carbon atom. Um, the central carbon atom would be, if I were to set this down on a desk, would be slightly raised from the, from the desk. And all of these hydrogens down here would be touching the desk. And this hydrogen up here would be sitting straight up off the top of that carbon atom. All right. So these would be kind of forming a little pyramid down here. And um, the reason that those are kind of slanted down is because this electron pair in this bond right here is kind of forcing those down a little bit, 
okay? Um, nitrogen has the ability to form a linear molecule, a bent molecule, or a trigonal pyramidal molecule. So this would be very similar to the tetrahedral. It just doesn't have this extra hydrogen up here. So this would just be, um, if I were to set that down on a desk, it would be, um, the nitrogen in the middle would be kind of raised up off the, off the desk there. All right, and then oxygen, depending on what it's uh, forming a compound with, if it's the central atom, it could form a linear compound or it could form a bent shape molecule. And this would be like an example of a bent shape molecule with oxygen would be like water. And then fluorine, because it only has the ability to form one bond, can only make linear um, connections with things if it's the central atom. And this would also be the same for hydrogen. Since hydrogen can only form one bond, it's only going to make um, linear compounds if it's you know considered the central atom. All right, so we are going to start by talking about boron, all right? Boron, it, if it is the central atom, then um, the overall shapes that could uh, could either be linear tri or trigonal planar because boron has three bonding electrons and no non-bonding electron pairs. And so I'm going to first draw the um, Lewis structure for B2, for boron, two boron atoms uh, bonding with each other. All right, so here are the Lewis dot structures. And I know this looks a little funny, but if you can just imagine that I've taken this Lewis dot structure up here and I've just kind of turned it sideways. Remember that this is just drawn flat on paper. And if I turn it sideways, then all three of these orbitals can kind of bond with each other. And so what happens is they're going to share electrons and form a triple bond because they're sharing three different pairs of electrons here. All right, and this is going to be a linear shape molecule. And another example of a molecule that boron can form would be uh, boron trihydride. So it's got boron with three hydrogens. And here we see that those hydrogens are sharing those orbitals here. And those are all single bonds. And this would be a, an example of a trigonal planar. It's trigonal because it's kind of a triangle shape. And it's planar because it's going to be flat. There are no non-bonding electron pairs um, around boron to force these bonds in, in that downward pyramid shape. And so they're going to be flat in the same plane. Okay. So that's for boron. Trigonal planar. And now let's talk about carbon. And this is good. These are going to be true for both carbon and silicone. So keep in mind that those are just representative of their families. So if carbon or any non-metal element from its family is the central atom, then the overall shape could either be linear, trigonal planar, or tetrahedral because carbon and other non-metal elements in its family have four bonding electron orbitals and no non-bonding electron pairs. So it has to form four bonds, okay? So the first compound we're going to do an example for is carbon dioxide, so CO2. So here's my carbon, and I'm going to have two oxygens. I've kind of just turned them a little bit so they can match up with the um, orbitals there on that carbon. They're going to bond with that carbon. And since each oxygen is sharing two electron orbitals, they're going to form double bonds with each carbon, right? So that is a linear molecule. All right. Now let's take a look at H2CO. It's hydrogen carbonate. All right. So I've got hydrogens um, that are pairing up over here. And oxygen is going to come form a double bond with uh, carbon here. So there are the bonds, and that is a trigonal planar shape. So you can see that one of these is composed of a double bond, and then these are single bonds over here. And because there are no non-bonding electrons around that central carbon, they're all going to be in the same plane. So if I were to set this down flat on a desk, all of those atoms would touch the desk. Okay? And this last shape is going to be um, demonstrating a tetrahedral shape. So here's carbon. And let's say we've got four hydrogens attached, so that's going to be four single bonds that are formed around that carbon. And that is tetrahedral, 
right? That's what a tetrahedral Lewis dot structure looks like. All right. Next, we're going to talk about nitrogen and its family. So if nitrogen or el any element from its family is the central atom, then the overall shape could either be linear, bent, or trigonal pyramidal because nitrogen and other elements in its family have three bonding electron pairs uh, or electron orbitals and one non-bonding electron pair. So I'm going to draw um, N2 first. So I've got two nitrogen atoms. They're going to pair up their orbitals, their bonding orbitals, and that's three pairs of electrons that are shared between them. So that's going to be a triple bond that occurs between nitrogen atoms. All right, and that is a linear molecule, and that is a triple bond in there between that. So now let's do HNO. All right, so I've got nitrogen, and there are th uh, one hydrogen, and then these last two bonds are going to bond with that oxygen. And that oxygen, remember, it can form two bonds. And so what happens here is I've got a double bond between nitrogen and oxygen and a single bond between nitrogen and hydrogen here. And then I've got this non-bonding electron pair up here that's acting just the same as a single bond or, or you know, any bond would. And so it's kind of forcing these into that um, almost trigonal planar Thing, but there's nothing up here to make that trigonal so we just call this shape a bent shape okay it's very similar to the shape of a water molecule but the angle is a little bit different but we'll just we're going to call it bent for right now <clears throat> all right then ammonia so nh3 is our last example here and so those three hydrogens are going to um, pair up with those three bonding orbitals on nitrogen and that is going to form a trigonal pyramidal shape. And so this is a pyramidal shape, and these are kind of bent downwards, holding that middle atom kind of up off the desk if I were to put that flat. And the reason that that's ha happening like that is because of this non-bonding electron pair. Remember, these are negatively charged electrons, just like the electrons that are making up these bonds. And they're repelling the bonds or the electrons in these bonds and kind of forcing them down into that pyramid shape. All right. The next family is oxygen. If oxygen or any non-metal element from its family is the central atom, then the overall shape could either be linear or bent because oxygen and other element, elements in its family have two bonding electron orbitals and two non-bonding electron pairs. All right, so I'm going to show you O2 first. I've got two oxygen um, atoms. They're going to pair up and form a double bond in between them because they're sharing their two um, bonding orbitals. All right, and that is going to be a linear molecule. And then I've got water, H2O. So I've got oxygen, and there are two hydrogens attached to that oxygen. This is the same kind of example we did at the very beginning. And we've got those bonds right there. And so that's going to be a bent shape, all right, because these non-bonding electron pairs um, are, are forcing these down into that bent shape. All right. The last family we're going to talk about is fluorine. And um, I'm just going to do F2 here for this example. So we're going to pair those up. They're going to form a single bond between those two fluorine atoms, and that is linear. And then I'm also going to include hydrogen with this group only for the, the simple fact that it's a nonmetal and it has it, the capability of only forming one bond as well. Um, so here's my example for hydrogen. We're just going to make um, hydrofluoric acid or hydrogen fluoride. And so that's going to pair up here and form a single bond, and that is also a linear molecule. All right, so I hope this video was helpful um, in helping you understand uh, how to draw the Lewis dot structures for covalent compounds, and then also how to determine the molecular shape. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and write those down, and we can talk about them in class, and I will see you guys then. Thanks for watching Buffered Chemistry. Subscribe to my YouTube channel for more chemistry help.